it jumps so high. Then you gonna come down, 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 down to the fourth of July, 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 July. Oh, Mary Mac! Mary Mac! Won't you come back? I love you so. Baby, please don't go. Baby, please don't go down to New Orleans. I love you so. Baby, please don't go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Going for it. Going for it. Embrace that song. That's a beautiful thing. We don't have much else. Because it's a love song. Ready for it? Yeah. Sure, why not? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yep, still here. Bring it. Okay, here it comes. Here it comes. Jesus and the dinosaurs. He loved them like he loved his horse. <laughs> Knew this wasn't gonna go Ladies <laughs> of easy virtue, oh, dinosaurs will try and eat you. <laughs> Six thousand year old earth is what I hear when fundamentalists bend my ear. The Big Bang's not a sound but theory. All us mammals are really hairy. <laughs> Dinosaurs are really scary. Dinosaurs, they ruled the earth long before the virgin birth. Not as long as scientists say, drop down on your knees and pray. Mammals, yeah, we got warm blood. Very few survived the flood. Dinosaurs, they left us fossils. Jesus left us apostles. <laughs> Jesus and the dinosaurs never fought in any wars. Maybe they will come again. Maybe they will be my friend. Will they love me? Well, that depends. When they get here, it will be the end. Jesus, he will know the score. Eat the rich and kill the poor. Get your ass up off the floor and make way for the dinosaurs. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see, here's, a, here's another song that I'd like to sing for you. So, Yay! Come on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ready for another one? It's another song I wrote. I don't know. I, I write songs. Everybody's going to have a hobby. Am I right? Um, okay, I got it. here we go. Martial law has been declared, and I'm a little scared. Martial law has been declared, and I'm a little scared. A new pres got elected. And I sat sad and dejected, but then I got awoke. I stood up and made a joke, but then he made a tweet that swept me off my feet. It seemed a little rough, so I called his little bluff. At first it was house arrest, <laughs> so I took it as a test. They marched up to my door. Made us get down on the floor. I scuffled with the men. They used to be my friends. They took away my wife. It cut me like a knife. When they just took her away, there was nothing left to say. I had no time to get my gun. The grenade was set on stun. I've had a boot on my head before, but without the foot in it pinning me to the floor. Martial law has been declared, and I'm a little scared. Scared. But the camps are beautiful at night. The stars, they are so bright. The camps are beautiful at night. The stars, they are so bright. We get the cable TV and the internet is free. 
the forced labor may be hard, but we get to walk the yard. The guards, they aren't so bad. One reminds me of my dad. The stars, they are so bright. There's not a fence in sight. The shock collars that we wear are so is sewn into our underwear. You've got to watch what you say or they'll come and take you away. One, two, three, four. I've got that Stockholm Syndrome. I've been taken hostage. I am loving my captors. They know what's best for me. It's a wait and see. I'm feeling some sympathy. Well, they told me a story. Well, I'm trying to explain. Well, that's just my government. <laughs> It's nothing personal. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. You deserve what you get. Don't you understand? It's part of a much bigger plan. They've got to be cruel to me. It's their job. Don't you see? They may hold all the cards, but obeying orders is not all that super hard. I've got that Stockholm Syndrome. I'll be taking chances. I will know what love is. I'll be learning new dances. <laughs> Martial love, love be the cats, and I'm a little scared. But the cats are beautiful at night. Thank you. All right, let's see. All right, I'm going to introduce you to my uh, running mate I mean, in 1992, like back in the day, before the internet was a, 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 the internet. Um, I used to set up tours using lists that I'd get at the uh, uh, various anarchist gatherings uh, or the Rainbow Guides, and people would put their names in these lists, and I would uh, call them up randomly. And uh, in 1990, um, 91, I was looking at towards 92 for the presidential campaign. I was thinking of running for president. I wanted to uh, test this theory that I could... Uh, hitchhike uh, and do, do tours, do tours with a backpack on my back and have different uh, random people uh, drive me to my next campaign stop. And so I did a 10 city two week tour down the east coast, uh, me and uh, my backpack and the little character I'm about to introduce you to. It was the first time I started wearing the boot uh, in public. The police were very interested in what I was doing. Um, the, the Hoboken police literally told me to get out of town by sundown after detaining me and running my paperwork. Uh, in Dover, Delaware, this cop took a long time to finally get around to something he could hang his brain on. <laughs> oh, like an actor. Yeah, okay, like that. So that was good. And uh, essentially, uh, these random people that I would call up uh, and say, Hi, Vermin Supreme, I'm right from Air of the Eastern Seaboard. You don't know me, but uh, can I stay at your house? Uh, <laughs> do, do you think you could feed me for a few days? That'd be great. Uh, uh, do you, do, could you print a few things up for me? Maybe throw a benefit for me? Or you know, I'd rattle off all these things and they'd say, yeah, okay, fine. And the only thing they had to do for sure was um, get me to my campaign stop within 100 miles. So that, that's how it was. It was leapfrogging down. So uh, we made as far as uh, New Jersey, Rutgers, New Jersey. We were at uh, uh, Rutgers University. Um, we were doing some campaigning and, and my campaign manager, Ed, at that time had a boom box. He had, he had this boom box and I don't know if you all remember cassette players, but this particularly had one had a knob that could speed up and slow down to compensate for the battery time. Player. So it was very cool. So I had a cassette tape uh, of the highway patrol that went something like, dun 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 bum 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 bum. And so this is the first time I, I worked with a, a soundtrack, and, and so we were speeding up and slowing it down, and things were getting weird, and we made our way through the campus and up to the radio station, and we, we did a thing on the radio, and nobody stopped us. And so then we're leaving, and, and this cop, uh, this guy comes trotting up in a, in a, in a tracksuit. Police! And uh, wanted to arrest us for trespassing. And so we got arrested for trespassing. And uh, they, okay, they processed this, let us go. And uh, But then later in the evening, we went to New York, we did our little show. We were coming back, we were trying to make Spook Candy's uh, talent show. And it was a talent show, but we had just missed it. So it was letting out. So the audience was letting out of this event. And at that same moment, a, a police officer came up to me and said, Hey, you, we found some marijuana in the police car after we let you go, and we want to charge you with this marijuana charge. And I'm like, okay. And in the meantime, I'm teaching the, the audience uh, that was leaving this song. Of, well, let me introduce you to my little 
little friend here, uh, so to speak. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is Spudhead McGee. And as I was teaching the audience the song, the sing-along, the, the song that you're going to learn right now, um, essentially um, what happened was that the, the co-op was searching me. He was searching the, uh, the, the doll, going through the doll's clothes looking for drugs, and we were singing this song. Are you ready to learn it? Yes. Okay, it goes. Oh it's Spudhead, Spudhead, Spudhead McGee. Okay, you all see him. It's Spudhead. Wave those arms. Spudhead, Spudhead McGee. He's a friend to you. He's a friend to you. He's a friend to me. He's a friend to me. Okay, from the top. It's Spudhead, Spudhead, Spudhead McGee. He's a friend to you. He's a friend to me. He's, he's a little rubber doll. A little rubber doll. Okay, from the top. <laughs> it's Spudhead, Spudhead, Spudhead McGee. He's a friend to you. He's a friend to me. He's a little rubber doll. But that's not all. But that's not all. He's possessed, He's possessed by Hey, Spudhead. Why can't you say hi to all these beautiful people who have come out tonight to, to see us perform? Hi, how are ya? Got a cigar? Oh, Spudhead. I thought you were trying to cut down. Oh, fuck off! Oh, oh, oh. Spudhead. What? What a bad doll. So, sometimes he tries to make me telepathically communicate with me and, and tries to make me do things that, that I don't want to do. No. No, Spudhead. No. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Give yourself a round of applause. You, you all sang that beautifully. All right. Um, Dan, can we get the? Can you get ready with the uh, the soundtrack thing? Okay. Going to do a, another reading here 
from the book. smell of burning plastic. Knowing immediate danger when he smelled it, and sensory overload when he experienced it, he tried to get a grip on the rapidly rising panic that his lizard brain was inducing. He looked around wildly through the chaos trying to assess the situation. Alarms and warning signs filled his ears. Instrument panels sparked and sputtered the smoke and the blinking danger lights gave the cramped space the look of a hellish disco. Through the porthole, a, a calm beam of sunshine pierced the smoke and darkness. His eyes landed on the beam. He was able to orient himself in the cabin. The steady voice of the ship's computer calmly made its pronouncement. Please evacuate the capsule. He quickly came to the conclusion that his spaceship continuum must have crash landed on some unknown planet. Well, that's a fine kick in the ass, he said to himself as he realized that he was up to his shins in water. The ship was sinking rapidly. Each and every one of the inflatable flotation gizmos, which was specifically designed to keep the stupid spacecraft afloat in just such an event, had obviously failed to deploy. The computer made a most welcome announcement. Atmosphere capable of supporting life. His rigorous training kicked in as he unstrapped his safety restraints and reached for the lever that would blow open the capsule door. Boom! The door blew open, arcing through the air, landing with a splash. Sunlight, fresh air, and fresh water flooded the cabin. It was a beautiful day. Filling his lungs with fresh air, he was able to regain his composure and reassess the situation. Looking about the rest of the capsule, it was clear his fellow chrononauts had not survived the trip. He winced at the sight of his desiccated colleagues. Then the perky synthesized voice chip chirped. Self-destruct sequence activated three minutes until vaporization. Something had tripped the self-destruct mechanism. Believing that Blue Man was plenty of time, Chuck quickly grabbed his kit bag his seat cushion, which also acted as a flotation device, and his inflatable life vest. His space fan ray gun, much to his chagrin, was secure in the gun locker right in front of his face. Two minutes until vaporization. There was not going to be enough time to enter the required information into the required fields to unlock his weapon. He could see it, but he could not get to it. Damn waiting times! He punched the plastic glass that stood in his way. Fuck! He swore. He really wanted his gun. Chuck waded over to the hatch and stepped up on his lip. Water poured up and over his time shoes and into the capsule. He looked down. Damn it! My favorite time shoes. They were indeed some really nice time shoes. He blinked and squinted into the bright sunlight. He felt its warmth on his stubbled cheeks. He shielded his eyes from the sun and scanned the horizon noting the direction of land. Pausing momentarily, he said something somber and witty about his deceased co-workers in regards to their imminent burial at sea. Something about the captain going down with the ship. Another one? Goodbye, my captain. Bolts of electricity crackled around the skin of the sinking capsule. As the space machine submerged, the water sizzled and boiled as steam fell upward. As the machine destroyed itself, it produced an awesome shockwave that rolled over the water surface. He paddled and kicked and kicked and paddled until he could paddle and kick no more. He made it to the beach. He pulled himself up onto land, sucking hard air. He blacked out. There was no turning back. Before Chuck opened his eyes, he could half remember his dream. A smile crept across his face. He felt the warmth of the day on his closed eyelids. A slight breeze caressed his skin. He was unsure as to where he was. Was he still in deep suspension on the ship? 
He did know that if he was experiencing this level of consciousness, the ship was approaching his destination and bringing him online. Slowly, he opened his eyes. He knew in a flash that he was no longer in space. Looking about, he found himself surrounded by humanoids. They looked like hippies. They were hairy all over and seemed to have no shame. They seemed to be unable to speak coherently and they smelled terrible. The tribe eagerly welcomed the lost man into their fold. Chuck had hoped these savages might treat him like a god, but it was not to be. Instead, they treated him with a kindness usually reserved for idiots or children. <laughs> Plus his little pee -peeking <laughs> He spent several days tagging along, joining them in eating nuts, berries, squirrels, and other small mammals. He was convinced one of their females was checking him out. If this was going to be his new life in this strange new world, he definitely wanted to get laid. <laughs> The tribe members' animal skin loincloths left little to the imagination. The women bared their breasts as if they were just another body part. There were worse planets to be stranded on, he thought. One fine day, as they made their way through the jungle, Chuck stopped to take a dump. The tribe continued down the trail. If nothing else, his new diet was keeping him regular. Chuck was on his haunches defecating several feet off the path when there appeared to be a hubbub at the front of the foraging expedition. He was cursing the lack of toilet paper on this otherwise serviceable planet when he noticed the commotion. He finished wiping his ass with some leaves, which he hoped were not poisonous. <laughs> no sooner had he pulled up his prone up britches when he heard what sounded like a stampede. Several of the hippies ran back past Chuck in the direction from which they had come. The tribe personified fear as they scampered by, being chased by who knows what. Within seconds, Chuck had been scooped up in a net and was being dragged along the ground. After a short but bruising drag along the jungle floor, he found himself being released from the net. Chuck and his fellow captives were surrounded by fierce, smallish horses! <laughs> snorting through their nostrils and kicking up dirt! Attracted by his strange, tattered spaceman guard, two members of the hunting party came up to Chuck. They reached out to touch the odd fabric. Chuck snarled loud and clear. Get your dirty hooves off me, you stinking ponies! <laughs> the ponies in the hunting party were stunned. Never before had they heard a human talk, let alone accuse them of stinking. With their superior pony strength and numbers, the pony soldiers quickly subdued the struggling man. They attached a massive yoke around his shoulders. Chuck was chained to the other human captives and led down the trail towards New Pony City. <laughs> Marching him through the jungle, the ponies taunted him. Do it again! Say something! They challenged Chuck as they poked him with sticks. No, you spell! Said another fan in the air with a hoof. Chuck decided to shut the fuck up. <laughs> and did not utter another word. Chuck shackled and naked in the lab. He listened as the pony scientists, wearing pony lab coats, went about discussing his imminent vivisection. We must cut him open and find out what makes him talk, said Dr. Zayas. I want his brain, said another. Let's cut off his balls, yelled another. Maybe we should keep him a while and experiment on him alive before dissecting his brain, said Dr. Zier, a lone voice of pony reason. We could still cut his balls off. <laughs> we will discuss this tomorrow, said Dr. Zayas, who was famous for putting off important workplace discussions until the next day. <laughs> They all left the lab and headed home to their stalls and paddocks. That evening, Dr. Zira came back to the lab to check in on the human prisoner. She glanced at Chuck through the bars with a gaze 
both tender and curious. She'd never looked at a human that way before. With apprehension and trance species lust aroused, Dr. Zira approached the cage. They longingly looked into each other's eyes. She stepped closer. He reached out with his arm and stroked her muzzle. She rubbed her muzzle on his arm, trembling, her pony muzzle lips, pink and moist, moved towards the man's stubbled man muzzle. Their interest, they mashed their faces together between the bars. Their interspecies tongue intertwined. Chuck almost gagged on his pony love's huge, wet pony tongue. He felt her equine teeth on his cheeks. He had his whole face in her mouth, and he was loving it. Pony saliva poured down his neck. His nipples hardened. His fingers became enmeshed in her silky mane. He tightly hugged her muscular neck and pulled her towards him through the bars. It was at this moment that Chuck first awoke from his dream. His heart was beating heavily and he was soaked in sweat. He had a huge erection that he had been rubbing on Jane, his wife. Jane, already nudged awake by his magnificent manhood, took a firm and steady grip of his studly saddle horn and positioned herself all reverse cowgirl style upon it. Not caring whether it was a piss hard on or not, she rode it for all it was worth. Married people with kids should always get it when they can. She reminded herself. As the sun's rays entered the room, joined in the chuck like that, sliding up and down on the old disco stick. Jane really loved her life and her husband. She went through her mental to-do checklist for the day as she approached her first orgasm. Her eyes rolled back in her head. Meanwhile, breathing heavily, Chuck could not let go of the image of Dr. Zier's big anime eyes and long pony eyelashes, the sexy pony lipstick, her sexy pony lips, and that lab coat all remained vivid in his mind. He wrapped his fingers in his wife's long hair, pretending that it was his dream lover's silky mane. He imagined what it might be like being Dolly Tomelli making love with the boy. He had spent a lot of time trying to visualize mechanics about my work. <laughs> he watched his wife's ass bouncing up and down and up and down. He watched his wife's ass bouncing up and bouncing down and bouncing up and bouncing down as he envisioned that he was fucking a hot, hot, hot pony pussy. Thank you. Thank you. Give yourself a round of applause for making through that one. Oh my God. Uh, yeah, so there, there's that. <laughs> I, I could sing another song if you wanted, or I could just scrap it up. <laughs> Maybe that's a good place to leave if the next song is a little over the top. <laughs> so, remember friends, there are two, 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 two types of people on this planet. Those in the ponies! And those that will not survive the transition times. <laughs> because the road to Ponytopia will not be easy. No, 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 no. Not all of us are gonna make it. Oh, there will be hardships. There will be sacrifices, human sacrifices. But let me assure you this, the road to Ponytopia will be paved with the glitter encrusted stalls of our vanquished foes. <laughs> because together, we're gonna ride our ponies into a zombie-powered future. Which is why, now, more than ever, you must decide what 
Consider this a valid form of campaign, so more power to them. And uh, also the officially endorsed candidate of the uh, Youth International Party, also known as the Yippies. And the Diamond State uh, Mary Pranksters. So I've got a, some serious, uh, yeah. So yeah, I guess that's it. That could be the show. And then, of course, I do have exciting merchandise. Of course, we have the uh, Vermin Supreme uh, brand drug test in case you're hanging out with your friends and it's like, hey, friends, I've been smoking marijuana. And they're all like, no, Sal, we don't believe you. It's like, hold on, I'll be right there. Last one. I gotta get one. And of course, we have the, uh, the, the Vermin Supreme pregnancy test uh, just in case if you must absolutely know 100% uh, if you are pregnant with Vermin Supreme's love child. Everyone should know. There. And, uh, yeah, got the glitter ties, we got stickers, we got all sorts of crap, so uh, check it out. Uh, I, I'm here for you. If you need the selfie, let me know. Thank you. Extra lenses? Oh, I maybe it didn't break off. Yeah, it's it's right. lens and oh, it's still it's still Woo! recording. Hi. Start. How about if I stop it?